Yes, it's a good here. Okay, we have got about 15 minutes here. I'm going to start the YouTube thing a little bit early. Um, having a little bit of an issue here with the Google Meet video for some strange reason seems to be seems to be flipped. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that and see what's going on here. It does. For whatever reason, it's flipped, and I don't understand how to get that corrected. <clears throat> so for those of you who are watching this, um, how do I do that? The Google Meet feed, I'm using OBS, and so I'm running OBS directly to Google Meet, and then I'm running OBS virtual camera, and the OBS, no, let me back up. I'm running the OBS feed to YouTube, and then I'm running the OBS virtual camera um, as the camera for Google Meet. And it seems that the output for the virtual camera is flipped, which is a little bit odd. Um, like I said, we've got about 15 minutes before, the, before I launch the Google Meet thing, so I'm going to see if I can figure out how to correct that. Um, but I appreciate you guys tuning in. We are going to dive into SEO in 2023, the new year. Um, we are going to uh, look at some different options and stuff and um, hopefully help everybody improve their SEO. So let me see here. Stream output. I don't see us. I don't see a place to do this. Hmm. Video. No. All right. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try. Oh, that's not what we need. I am going to try to disconnect from Google Meet. And then I'm going to try reconnecting to Google Meet and we'll see what that does. It's still flipped. I don't I don't understand that. Um, Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe if I join it. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, I apologize. Um, you can follow along with the audio. It's going to be very difficult for you to to follow the, the uh, PowerPoint just because it's flipped around. But when... Um, when I get done with this, I'll just take the video and flip it and then re-upload it. Um, I apologize for that. I don't know. Um, I don't know why it's doing that, but, but we'll figure it out. Um, hey, Stephanie, I apologize it, it, on my side, and you can confirm this for me, but the video is flipped, and I can't figure out why it's doing that. It's only doing it on Google Meet. The YouTube thing looks fine. So um, uh, I don't know. So you tell me what you see on your end. Let me see if I can. It certainly looks like it's flipped. So I don't know. If you're seeing it flipped or whatever, don't freak out. I will correct it and upload it to YouTube when we're done here. Um, we've got about 12 minutes. Um, hopefully we'll get some more people connected. And I am just going to poke around and see if I can figure out how to correct this video thing here while we wait for 11 o'clock.
Okay, so what I'm finding says that the the mirrored image only shows on the channel owner's screen, but everybody else sees it normally. Okay, so that's a good deal. So maybe Google Meet, maybe we're fine on that. I don't know. I don't know. Yes, maybe I can go to a, see if this works. You want me to Oh great, Stephanie. I'm glad it looks I'm glad it looks fine then. And I'll stop trying to figure out how to correct this. I don't know. It's just a weird thing. On mine it's completely mirror imaged on my thumbnail view down there, whatever. So okay. As long as it looks good on your end, that's fine. Because it would be it would be pretty difficult to follow a PowerPoint in mirror view. At least it would for me. So where are you from, Stephanie? The video next week. I actually have a. I'm at my desk right now. Um, I actually have a little small video production studio downstairs, but we're having some work done on it, and, and it's not going to be ready until next week. All right, Brittany, Russ, welcome, Brittany. Um, we uh, I kick things off a little bit early to work out a couple of bugs, so I'm just kind of hanging out here. Um, if you want to hop over in the chat and oh you can't you can't hear me oh that that's not good okay let's see if we can figure out why you can't hear me okay let's see here um sh should be able to everything here looks fine um let me see if YouTube can hear me see here yep okay so the YouTube the YouTube streams got audio um, okay let's see if we can figure out why Google meet okay that's weird Stephanie um, no, I didn't accidentally mute or anything. Uh, let's see here then. In call messages somewhere. All right, we've got people coming in. So guys, um, Stephanie said she can't hear me. So while I try to figure out why that's happening, if you if you can hear me or if you can't hear me, um, pop in the chat and let me know. What's going on? Yeah, everything, even the thing on here shows 
that the feed has got audio. So let me do this. I'll switch off. Now you shouldn't be able to hear me at all. And then I will go back to here and you should be able to hear me. That should, that's, it's blinking, it's showing, I don't know. Um, hmm, I don't know. Okay, Brittany says she can hear. So I don't know, Steph. That might be something on your side, but she can't hear me. All righty. All right, so we've got, oh, we lost, okay, maybe Stephanie is logging out and logging back in. I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me on this. I really do. We're going to kick off here um, in about five minutes, um, and I'm going to run through a PowerPoint that I actually borrowed from someone else um, just to kind of give you guys an overview of what we'll be doing, and Stephanie is back. And we can see her. I don't know if I even have my audio on. But anyway. Yeah, I checked to see if I had accidentally muted her, but but I haven't. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, everything looks good from my side, so I don't know. But this is these are growing pains and the learning curve. So um, as I go through this, obviously, I'll get better. Hello, Amanda. How are you? Obviously, as we do more of these, we'll figure out the bugs and stuff. Um, so if you can or can't hear me or whatever, just kind of give me an update on that. I, I don't know what I'll be able to do at this point to, to fix it, but at least I'll know. Yeah, re rebooting fixes 80% of the issues. That's right. My wife or my mom will call me and they'll be like, hey, um, my device is not doing this or my device is not doing that. I'm like, have you rebooted it? No, well, reboot it and call me back. And they call back and they're like, okay, it works now. Okay, so other people can hear. Steph, I, you haven't responded, so I don't know if you can hear or not. I'm assuming since you're still hanging out with us, you probably can hear. Um, all right, got people coming in. Good deal. I love it. And I'm not sure if we'll stick on um, the Google Meet platform or not. It depends on how many people we get in the meetings. Um, Google Meet supports like 100. Um, if we've got more than 100 people at one time, I'll be blown away just because of time zones in different countries and things like that. But if we find ourselves running up against that 100 number, um, I'll look at some different options for that. Um, we are about two and a half minutes away from kicking this off. Again, I appreciate you guys uh, wanting to grow your business through SEO. Um, I know that, you know, I've, I've done internet marketing, well, I guess my first true internet marketing thing was in 1999. I was living in Sacramento, California, and I ran into this company that was buying internet leads. It was an insurance company. And so I talked with the owner, and uh, he said, yeah, I said, if you can bring me car insurance leads, I'll, I'll pay you for them. And so I found a guy up in Northern California who had a, Corvette enthusiast chat board and he had thousands and thousands of members on there and so I bought banner ads from him that went across the top of his Corvette enthusiast chat website and that was sort of my first dip into internet marketing. I'm a workaholic. Um, I'm, by day I'm the vice president of marketing for a housing company that's based in South Dakota. I've been with them for 15 years. We do about 40 plus million a year in business. 
Um, so, you know, in any given year, I manage anywhere between, you know, a quarter of a million dollars and a half million dollars of online advertising budget. So I, you know, you guys and, and other people who, who deal with me, um, have the benefit of, well, I forgot people where I have to prove people to come in here. So we get in there. Um, I've been able to fail quite a lot with online marketing. So I know what doesn't work. And so by knowing what doesn't work, you learn what does work. So, um, and then obviously I have a professional photography studio. Uh, and then my wife is a realtor and I handle all of her marketing stuff as well. So I don't sleep very much or you would think I wouldn't anyway. Um, so it is officially 11 o'clock and I'm going to sort of move this window aside. Not that you guys can see that or anything, but I'm going to move this over just because other people may be coming in late and I want to make sure I can get them added to the meeting. So welcome guys. This is our first episode, I guess, as it were, or our first meeting anyway, of the SEO accountability group for 2023. And I did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, my primary reason is I believe that the more we can share information, the more that we can come together as a group of professional photographers and raise each other up, the better the industry is for me, the better the industry is for you. A buddy of mine says a rising tide lifts all ships, and I firmly believe that. I'm also a big advocate of paying things forward. I firmly believe that the easiest way for me to learn new things is to teach somebody else what I already know. Um, I've done that in a lot of things and it seems to be pretty true across the board. So I'll be doing this for um, 52 weeks um, whenever possible. If something happens or whatever, obviously I'll make some accommodations for that. If I have to go out of town or whatever, I might record this earlier and repost it or whatever. Um, but I am going to make a commitment to you guys to do this weekly with you so that we can help move each other forward. Um, got a couple of other people hopping in here and we're going to get them approved. All right. All right. What is that bringing us up to here? It gives us a room count of 16 right now, which is great. So anyway, um, for those of you tuning in uh, now, I was just letting them know I'm making a commitment to you guys to do this weekly. Um, I ask that you guys... Um, if you can't make the live, and I get that because of time zones and life things and families and jobs and stuff like that, um, at least watch the um, the the video on YouTube. And, and I'm going to try to simulcast those. Um, but if I can't, if something goes on wrong or whatever, um, I will definitely, um, I'll definitely, well, it helps if you record what you're doing. I'll definitely make sure that we get the recording uploaded to YouTube. So anyway. Without further ado, um, we'll get in here. I'm not charging for any of this, um, but, you know, I do have my cash app on screen. If you guys want to buy me a coffee or whatever, if you find value in this and you're like, hey, Jason, that was awesome. Let me send you three bucks, five bucks or pay for your Caribbean vacation. However you guys want to do that, I'm fine with that. It's definitely not a requirement, um, but I just wanted to, to sort of give you guys an opportunity. I've done these things in the past and people are like, hey, I'd like to, you know, give you a tip or buy you a coffee or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know. So I just decided to throw that in up front. If you guys want to do that, fine. If you don't, that's fine too. Not a big deal. Let's jump right in here and talk about a couple of things here. Um, and I'm just going to run through this as sort of a 101 primer for people. Um, some of this may be stuff you already know. Some of it may be stuff that you don't know. And I did not assemble this PowerPoint presentation. I found it online, but you know, it said what I wanted to say, so I didn't see any real reason in reinventing the wheel. Um, so what is SEO? We're going to talk about that quickly. How does it work and how to succeed? And then we'll wrap up with a few takeaways. And then I'll give you guys um, a little bit of homework. And that's sort of the format that I hope to follow week to week. Um, I'll present you guys with some, with some sort of theory information. And then I'll give you guys some homework and then you've got the week to go ahead and put that into application. Um, so moving right along, we talk about what is SEO. And they're very, they're, there are a couple of different types of SEO. There's on-site SEO, and that's what you do with your page 
um, in order to make it m more attractive to Google. And we'll talk about some best practices and I'll make sure that you guys have all the information you need to on that. On-site SEO and then off-site SEO is typically link building. And we're going to talk about some of that too. Um, but we're going to begin talking about or we're going to begin our work with on-site SEO. So anyway, and I'll just breeze through this for you. Search engine optimization or SEO is the process of affecting the visibility of a website or web page in a search engine's unpaid results, often referred to as natural, organic, or earned results. Now I want to talk really quickly about these companies that you see out there. And if I opened up my regular email, I would probably easily be able to find at least two or three companies that are offering to do Oh, I, they can guarantee you that within a week or whatever, you'll have first page uh, rankings for whatever keyword. And it's a little bit deceptive. Um, they're not helping you with SEO. What you're doing is you're buying that keyword in the three Google ad spots that appear near the top of the search results. And I can I can absolutely tell you guys from from having spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on on Google pay-per-click ads, the value of the traffic that comes from organic SEO absolutely eclipses the value of traffic that comes from Google ads. Google keyword ads are probably the number two way to get fresh traffic to your website, um, SEO being number one, but engagement and time on platform and search depth and all that stuff is always worse on paid traffic than it is on organic traffic. So be very careful when you look at those people who do those things um, and make those make those claims that they can get you on the first page of Google. They can, you're going to pay for it and you're going to be paying for traffic that is not nearly as um, valuable and durable as the traffic that you get from SEO. So anyway, um, if we take a look at this little graphic over here, it kind of gives you an idea of some of the elements that play into a, I guess, a good or a perfect um, SEO campaign. Keyword research, and that's one of the things that you guys are going to be um, going away with as homework tonight, is absolutely critical. And I don't know if that's why they put that at the 12 o'clock position or not, but knowing what to, knowing what to optimize for so that your, let me check over here and make sure I accidentally clicked off that, make sure that we don't have anybody else trying to get in. And we do have people trying to get in. Jason, you got to remember to let these people in. It's a learning curve, guys. I'm sorry I left you guys hanging out in the lobby. Hopefully you made friends. Um, keyword research is probably the most important thing that you can do. Um, and I'll just run a lot around these in clock order. And, and we'll just cover link building. Obviously, I said we're going to talk about that. Site map optimization. We're going to talk about all of these things by the time we're done. Um, software development. They've got that under HTML. That's really the, the nuts and bolts of your website. Um, I use Pixie Set and WordPress for my business sites. I don't know what you guys are using, but all of the things that I talk about over the course of the next year is going to be... Um, centric to Pixie Set and WordPress, just because that's what I use and that's what I'm most familiar with. So if you're using a different platform or whatever, um, you'll need to transpose that information accordingly to fit your platform. Web design, and we're going to talk about web design uh, as we get into um, my theory on blog posts is the blog content. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I, I know 100% that most of your site visitors are not going to read a 500 word blog post. They're just not. Human nature tells me that they're not. People will watch a two minute video before they will spend two minutes reading a 500 word blog post because that's just the way our lazy brains work. And we're going to work through that and we're going to use some web design elements. We're going to use some graphic elements to be able to guide your looky-loo traffic through that blog post and get them to commit to the actions that we want, which is either book with us or at least give us contact information so that we can then turn around and put you into some sort of a drip marketing campaign. Um, feedback, I consider feedback to be Google and Facebook reviews and people are like, oh, okay, Jason, what does that have to do with SEO? It has a lot to do with SEO because trust me on this one, Google 
in their algorithm, and this is just a guess because they won't let me look at their algorithm, but in their algorithm, I'm 100% convinced that they factor in various things that go on on your website, your Google business um, page. If you haven't completed a Google business page, then that is your A1, number one goal between now and next week is to get that done. So you guys who don't have a Google business page, you're probably going to get double homework because you really need to do that. So anyway, feedback and reviews are important. Actually having a strategy. Why are we doing what we do? And that's part of what we're talking about right now. Um, having an effective SEO or really having an effective internet marketing and content creation strategy is critical. And we'll talk about that a lot as we move forward. Um, obviously, social networks. We know you guys are all here. Um, I got another person popping in here late. I apologize for you guys. I, I'm, I'm trying to focus on the camera and stuff and my notification thing is over here. Welcome, everybody. Um, obviously, social networks are critically important for our business in 2023. That's why you guys are here. Um, you know, in a matter of somewhere around 48 hours or whatever, I was able to amass a list of about 140 uh, people from one Facebook group. And Mike Sasser does a great job. And, and I'm so glad that that they allowed me to um, use their resources to, to get in touch with you people. So anyway, um, social networking, we know that's important. Content, content is king. Content is always going to be king. And we are going to talk about some content creation strategies for your blog posts that don't keep you sort of locked into, oh my gosh, how, do I, how could I possibly type a 500 word blog post every day? You know, I'm a, I'm a, no, I am by no measure a professional or proficient typist or whatever. I think I do about 130 words a minute um, with an error rate that's probably way outside of anything that's acceptable. So actually sitting down and typing for me um, is a giant pain. It's not something that I enjoy. So I shortcut things because um, my tech background, <clears throat> excuse me. My tech background causes me to lean on process automation. And when we get into some of the more advanced marketing stuff, we're going to talk a lot about process automation because I'm a big fan of that. In fact, um, I put some process automation tools in place so that when you guys were sending me messages on Facebook and stuff, it would automatically <clears throat> capture your, your information, <clears throat> my goodness, and send out some emails automatically. Traffic monitoring, if you're not going to do anything about it, don't measure it. But we have some great measurement tools. Um, the Google Analytics, Google Ads, they have some really good information that you can glean from, from your visitors on what they like, what they don't like, and things like that. And in my opinion, traffic monitoring goes hand in hand with remarketing. So if you're bounce, if you're dropping a thousand people onto your Valentine's boudoir ad and 80% of those people are bouncing without even going to the next page or whatever, you need to be remarketing to those people. You need to be aggressively remarketing to those people. And we've all run into it. If you go on Amazon right now and you type in fuzzy purple widget, by the time we get done with this talk, you'll be getting ads on Facebook and other places for, for, for fuzzy purple widgets. And that's just the world we live in. And the great thing about that is, from an advertising perspective, it helps us to eat more easily get our ads in front of people who are the most have the highest potential to be interested in those ads, and that's important. So we'll talk about that stuff as we go through. Um, ranking, obviously, that's why we do SEO is to get our pages as high as we can <clears throat> on the on the and I say search engine rankings because. You know, there's there's other search engines that are out there. I personally, in the last decade, have not done one ounce of optimization or targeting for MSN or Bing or whatever. They command such a tiny piece of the traffic pie that just doesn't make sense to allocate resources to that. So the 100 percent of 100 percent of the search engine stuff that we talk about in this course will be focused on Google because that's where I do my business and that's what um that's what we're going to be talking about. And so finally, that brings us to um, website optimization, which is on-site SEO, which is really the bulk of what we're going to be talking about um, during the, the, the length of this course. And we'll delve into everything that's along this line here. 
So I want to pop over here really quickly. And let's talk about what is the anatomy of a SERP search engine results page. That's just geek talk for search engine results page. When you type a term into Google and all of the different options appear, that is called a SERP. And so the thing that triggers the SERP is the keyword or the search query when someone types in or when someone says, hey, Google, find boudoir photographers near me. That's where everything begins. Um, the next option we have below is the paid, uh, the paid product listings or the Google shopping stuff. And um, I, if you figured out a way to monetize your um, boudoir photography business by using that section, I'm certainly happy to hear it. I've got some ideas myself, but I haven't put them into place. But normally, um, if people are searching for a transactional something like you know, whatever, like head, headlight for my, you know, for my Ford pickup or whatever. Um, that's where I go to look. If I'm looking for something um, like informational or relational, and I'll say this about boudoir photography. Um, Zig Ziglar, who is, a, who is an old, I'm not sure if he's still alive. I don't think he is. But he's from Mississippi, and he was one of the old sales training guys, you know, and you'd buy the book of Zig Ziglar cassette tapes and all that, and I'm dating myself. I'm, 53 years old, so I remember some things that probably a lot of you guys don't remember, whatever. Um, but in 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 Zig's euphemisms and things that he used to say, he would say, you know, that that people um, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about here is going to be relational stuff. You know, he also said that people can't do business with you until they know, trust, and love you. And this is a good example that Google is the place where they begin to know about you because people can't, they can't do business with us until they know that we're in business, right? So that all begins with a keyword query. If they put in best boudoir photographer, San Antonio, Texas, and your name comes up toward the top of that stack, you get an assumed amount of authority because they trust Google and because Google trusts you enough to put you in the top five or 10 or three or whatever, then you inherit a little bit of that trust. So they need to know about you. That happens on Google. They need to trust you. And that actually begins, like I said, on Google based on where your position is in the rank. So let's just think about this for a second. If we typed in, you know, best mechanic in my town, would you trust the, the guys that are appearing in the top three organic spots or would you trust the guy who's appearing in spot number 37? I don't know that where you appear on Google has any real world bearing on how good you are or aren't at your business, but I do know that in society, in our internet culture, there is a certain amount of gravity that is given to those ones on the top. So they got to know you, they got to trust you. And then in order to do business with you, they have to love you. And that is a really important thing when it comes to boudoir because boudoir photography is not a transactional business. It is a relational business. Um, and my, I've got a cousin who lives in Austin, Texas. And I share my work with her all the time because she's, she's a good, honest, loving critic. She's going to tell me, Jason, that doesn't look good or... I like this one better than that one, and I appreciate that. And if you don't have people in your circle who can tell you that that is not a good photograph, you need to adjust your circle. And I'm getting a little bit off SEO here, but just posting stuff on Instagram or Facebook or whatever and having a million people say, oh, that's gorgeous, oh, that's the best, oh, oh, whatever, that's fine, and that makes us feel good, but that doesn't help us grow. So if you guys don't have a good partner who can look at your work and say, hey, you need to you need to do a couple of different things here. Um, you're doing yourself a disservice. But anyway, I digress. Um, so what the anatomy of a search? So so the orange box there is going to be the shopping stuff. And like I said, maybe we should do an experiment and see if we can leverage um, some profit potential out of that. The next one is the paid search results. And these are the guys I was telling you about earlier who guarantee that they can get you on the front page of Google, you know, in 24 hours or whatever for the low, low price of $3.99 or whatever their pitch is. That's where your ads are going to appear in the purple box. And those are, number one, largely ignored. And, and I use myself as, a, as an example of that. You guys tell me 
when you're looking for something, how many of the ads, you know, do you, do you click on? I know some people do because I make a ton of money running Google ads. I know people do, but I also know that they are largely ignored. And I also know that they are um, low quality, lower, I won't say low quality, they're lower quality traffic. They're a heck of a lot better quality of traffic than what you get from Facebook. And anyone who has run Facebook ads on here can tell you that Facebook ads, unless you really, really, really put your groundwork in place first, can be a disappointment. They're a disappointment for most people because most people don't don't run them right. And we'll get into Facebook ads probably about midpoint through the year. But I want to make sure you guys have got your SEO and your on-site stuff nailed down first. And then finally, in the blue box down here, we've got organic search results. And that's what we are really going to be concerned about here. Those other two at the top are pay for play. And then the organic stuff down here at the bottom. I mean, you're having to pay for it. Your time is worth money. Um, but your organic, your organic investment, your investment in organic search engine placement is going to be a heck of a lot more durable than anything that you could possibly put into any kind of pay per click. Because when you stop paying, the pay per click goes away. If you invested five hundred or five thousand or fifty thousand dollars in 2023 into your organic search engine placement and then you didn't spend another dime on SEO for the next six or 12 months or whatever, you're still going to see residual traffic from that because the search engine rankings are a lot more durable. So that kind of gives you an overview of what we're, what we're going to be doing. And this is just to touch on something that I've already mentioned here a little bit. Okay. The, the paid search clicks are largely ignored. And 94% of the people who are going to be searching are going to be looking for organic results. So you can pay to get into that spot, but, you know, the, the, the price of entry is going to be higher. And then the quality of what you get out of it is going to be lower. Um, organic is the market-wide voice of the customer. Um, telling you what customers want in the moments that matter. And that's a really good thing for us to consider as marketers. Google is a great barometer of what people are searching for because literally all, all the search engine is meant to be. Now, they're, you know, they data mine and they sell advertising. They do a lot of stuff. But in terms of what we're looking at here, they're really just presenting relevance, right? And so Google, in all of its algorithmic calculations, comparing your website and your page and your structure and all that to things that they have found in the past that were relevant. And then they make comparisons to those and go, okay, if this page X in days gone by was relevant for purple, fuzzy purple widgets, and this page today has some of the same elements that page from long ago had, then it must be relevant as well. And that's really a simplified version of how a search engine algorithm works and the and the more people engage with your content okay so like as an example let's just take the top three search results for fuzzy purple widget if people skip the first one and go to the second one or worse if people go to the first listing and they don't engage with the page so let's say they that years ago days ago weeks ago whatever this page was relevant for fuzzy purple widgets and they got out of the fuzzy purple widget business and got in the boudoir photography business. Now fuzzy purple widget traffic is landing on a boudoir page and people leave. And the search engine goes, wait a minute. So maybe this isn't as relevant as we thought it was. So user behavior has a tremendous amount of impact on how you rank on your search engine placements. And that's our job to make sure that, okay, so here's the thing. Years ago, I was like, okay, I want to get every possible keyword that I can come up with for, for this particular industry. And one of the key phrases that I had targeted, because it was easy, it was the, the, the amount of difficulty to rank for that keyword was, was easier than some of the other ones. And I thought, hey, it would be better to rank for this quickly than it would be to rank for this over the long term, but I'll still continue to work for this. So anyway, my point is this. Cheap, my product, was one of the keywords that I targeted. Because I thought, you know, well, if I, if I can just bring people in who are interested in cheap purple widgets, then I, maybe I can convince them that my more expensive 
fuzzy purple widgets um, are the thing for them. And that's not the case because it was killing my, my bounce rate on the page because people were coming there looking for cheap and nothing that I sold was cheap. So I went in and removed any reference to, to anything that might attract people who are looking for, for cheap. Because the last thing we would want to do would be to find our business listed in someone's comment where they say, hey, I'm looking for a cheap boudoir photographer. Oh, well, why don't you call Jason? No, I don't. Not, no, thank you. I don't need that in my life, right? But I was doing it to myself. So anyway, Google is a great barometer to tell us what people are searching for. And if you would like to sort of find out what the buzz is in your area, just go to Google and type in Google Trends, T-R-E-N-D-S, and you'll be able to go in there and type in boudoir in, and you can, you can adjust it regionally or you can type in, you know, boudoir photographers in San Antonio or San Diego or whatever. And it will show you a chart that Google has surmised from, from all of its data mining. And it will show you the popularity of searches in your area for that particular keyword. And I think you'll find that different regions, people are searching for boudoir photography at different times. And for, for my particular reason, re, region and for reasons that I'm not clear on, um, people start searching for boudoir stuff in October. And I don't know why. You, you know, in my brain, I would think that it would be, you know, somewhere around maybe Valentine's Day. So maybe, you know, right now in January, people are searching for boudoir stuff because they're wanting to, you know, give a gift for Valentine's Day. I don't see that happen in my, in my area. Your mileage may vary. And then I thought, you know, that I would see increases, you know, around, you know, wedding time, you know, in this, you know, from spring into June or whatever. Um, but that's not the case. So apparently, you know, Mississippi people start looking for boudoir for Halloween. I don't know. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But definitely ticks up in October. So anyway, um, I'll just breeze through these last items and we'll go to the next page. Um, buyers turn to organic at the research stage. And I want to talk about this a little bit too, because we need to think about where our buyers are in their decision-making process and line that up with our marketing. And these are some things that, that I, I'm going to touch on more of, but I want you guys to think about that. Is your advertising lining up with where your buyers are in the, in the process, right? Okay. And I'll tell you this, most people do not buy relational, don't make relational purchases um, based on first impressions, right? There's a rule called the rule of seven plus or minus two, and it applies to a lot of things in life. Um, the reason our phone numbers in North America are arranged the way they are is because our brains can remember seven things plus or minus two. So we group our prefix in three numbers in brackets and then the telephone number follows in four number brackets and then we can always remember you got to dial one for long distance right and so that's the reason that we compartmentalize that data like that is because our brains are wired that way in advertising the rule of seven plus or minus two means this in order for a person to make a purchasing decision they must come in contact with your brand message somewhere between five and nine times now, we can shortcut that a little bit with like buy one, get one free or 75% off or whatever. You can adjust that five to nine number up or down a little bit, but there's always cost involved in that, right? You've either got to give up some profit in order to do that, or you've got to do some things. So keep in mind that in order for a person to decide to do business with you, they're going to need to see your ad. I got another person popping in here. Welcome, latecomers. They're going to need to see your ad somewhere between five and nine times. So that $20 boosted Facebook post that's going out to 428,000 people is never going to get you any business because the people are not seeing it with enough frequency to make a decision. I'm not saying that you can't make money with Facebook ads. I'm saying you can't make money with Facebook ads doing the occasional boost because you're just not getting that information in front of people fast enough or with, 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 with efficient frequency. Yeah, I know there's some of you guys out there who are like, well, I did a Facebook boost and I got bookings. Yep, yep. 
blind squirrels find acorns every now and then. I get that, but in the long in the long term, it's not a sound strategy. And I've lost. I've I have invested. I don't say wasted or lost. I've invested a lot of money in it to be able to make these decisions. Now, there's some ways that we can run Facebook ads, and we'll talk about that, but that's for another day. Um, consumers use search engines for purchase decisions, and that's true if we're moving into the transactional side of things. So when we're talking about the relational side of things, people got to know, trust, and love you before they're going to get naked. You know what I mean? They, we're doing intimate photography, so there has to be intimacy there between the subject and the photographer as much as anything else, or it just doesn't work, right? So they're going to come to find you to find out if they can trust you. And then 90% of smartphone users look for information, not for brands. And I got to be honest with you, if you're, if you're optimizing for desktop now, it's not really the greatest investment of time. We all know that it is all about the mobile. All right, we're going to have to run through these. I'm talking too much. The higher your web listing ranks, the more organic traffic you can acquire. And that's true. And then there's some things that we can talk about when we get into, into doing paid ads. And that's going to be later on down the road. Um, but there's some tricks that you can use to get into a, a better spot on paid ads. And I'll tell you this, too. Um, usually with SEO, the number two spot is almost better than the number one spot. It's just a, It just has to do with the way that people scroll and our eyes work but definitely the top three is going to be our goal on things um 43 percent of searches click on the top three organic SERP rankings obviously that's what we just said um so let's talk a little bit about how um seo works and i've touched on this a little bit so i'm not going to labor on this um and we have a lot of stephanie's in this thing um I'm not going to labor on this too much because we talked about it already. For those of you who are joining us late, welcome. I'm happy that you guys are here. Never feel like because you didn't make it exactly at 11 that you need to not do this. Um, it's important that we do it. Um, let me see here. Let me check really quickly the, the chat. Let me see. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we've got some questions about, yeah, I'm not sure, um, Michael, I'm not sure what the, what the broadcast, I'll have to check on that. So if you, if the, and give me feedback on that. If the video quality is not good, let me know if the audio quality is not good. Um, we have a fiber connection here, so I have super fast internet, um, and, but I need your feedback on that. Um, oh, you can't read the screen. Does any, anybody else have a problem seeing, being able to see what's on the screen? So let me just run through these real quick. Um, we got people from Denver. Um, okay, uh, we got all right. Good. I, I appreciate the fact that you guys are chatting among each other. Google thinks Google thinks you shoot Google thinks you shoot prawn. So Google ads are out for now. Okay. Um, we're we we'll, this is when we when we transition from search engine stuff into paid ad stuff. Um, I'll talk with you guys a little bit about some sort of best practices. I like intermediate landing pages so that you're not driving traffic directly to your website. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, about some of the strategies to sort of get around some of that weird Google stuff that goes on. Um, okay, so we, all right, I feel like we're good on that. And, and I'll, I'll try to make sure that we're getting the best quality of, of, um, of video and audio. So give me feedback and when I'm done, I'll read through that. So anyway, um, the way the search engine itself works is this. Um, the, the search engine Crawlbot scours the internet looking for new information, updated information or whatever. It is an information sponge. And it it's, I'm pop this so you guys can see me. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see what we got going on here. Um, wait, wait, wait. Hang on a second here, guys. I'm, Turn that off so it's not. Okay. All right, there we go. Because I know just because I know you guys want to see me. Face is hell. So anyway, the search bot crawls all over the internet and it's looking for new or updated information. And it uses links from one page to another to do that. That's why inbound links or off-site SEO is important, and we'll definitely talk about that. And as bots find pages on the webs, they decide whether or not they want to include that web page 
within their index based on their own set of criteria. And that's that relevance thing that we talked about um, before. And let me scooch this right over here to the side and transition out of that. And then finally, um, once a search engine has built up its index, it'll rank those pages according to relevancy. So we talked about that before. Um, the Google algorithm, let me, let me get over here. The Google algorithm has changed literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times since I've been doing anything with it. And here's the thing. We will build, we will build the best mousetrap that we possibly can, and we will see our number of pages indexed soar, and we will see our number of pages on front page and top 10 and top 5. We'll see all that soar, and then one day we'll, we'll be like, what's going on? And Google will have changed the algorithm, and we got to start all over building stuff, and that's just the nature of the way things work. Um, Google makes algorithmic changes, and um, there's nothing we can do about that except to just, you know, do what we need to do in order to make adjustments to that. Um, so this is just an example of some of the major Google algorithmic changes, and they have minor changes that happen all the time. So that's just part of the, the nature of the beast that we're dealing with. Um, this is getting into um, some 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 discussion about uh, um, sort of how we create our blog posts and things like that. And we're going to talk about these blue stripes is is where we live and die when it comes to search engine stuff. Those are going to be the headlines of our life story, as it were. So we need to make sure that we're paying attention to those. Um, and basically, all this page is telling us is is that the higher the uh, the listing is, the more um, relevant it is believed to become. Um, how to succeed in SEO, and that's where you guys are. That's why you guys are here. Thirty six minutes into it, and Jason is telling you guys what you came to know. Um, we we'll talk about let's talk about code a little bit here. And I said earlier that um, that. I use Pixie Set and I use WordPress, and um, WordPress is probably my absolute favorite website building platform. It is super easy to optimize um, for SEO. It's it's just great. It is the gold standard, in my opinion, for um, for web development. Pixie Set is useful because they handle galleries and they handle billing and they handle things like that. Pixie said is not the best, in my opinion, for SEO. It's, it's a little bit more difficult to get your pages to rank with them, and I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's just because they have so many websites hosted on their server, and Google just has to sort through all of that and determine if this website is independent of that website. I'm not sure what their... What their the reason is, but I can tell you that that it is more difficult to get a site to rank on Pixie Set than it is to get one to rank on WordPress, or at least that's been my experience. But I will also say this, that the pages that do eventually um, rank with with Pixie Set are they seem to be durable, right? They seem to they seem to hold their ranking well. So. Um, you know, it's a double-edged sword, and it is what it is. So code is obviously important. It may or may not be something that you can do anything about, depending on um, where you've got your uh, website hosted. I don't know. I don't know enough about Wix or some of these other things to make a comment about about how easy it is or isn't to get pages to rank with them. So anyway, code code is important. Sometimes we can control it sometimes we can't um, content and we're going to talk about content a lot and because I mentioned earlier content is king content is what the search engine spiders are looking for content is the thing that we have absolute control over and so that is going to be the primary focus of what we're doing um, and then community you know um, being able to be found use your social media channels to push out 
new blog content. Um, you know, that's that's obviously best practices. We're all going to do that anyway when we have new content on our site. We're definitely going to use our channel. So, um, and we'll breeze through this. There are some things on your page that search engines get to see. There are some things on your page that search engines don't get to see. Um, there are some best practices that we might not consider to be bad, but search engine uh, spiders do. An example of that is low contrast text. A lot of people years ago, they would stuff down at the bottom of their page, they would stuff best photographer in Albuquerque, best photographer in Abilene, best photographer, whatever. And it was called keyword stuffing. And it worked for a while until Google changed their algorithm and they would put white text on a white background. And so the humans wouldn't be able to see it, but the search engines would. But Google wised up to that and, and they you know, took steps to make sure that that was no longer effective. In fact, it will actually cause you problems in your rankings if you do some of those things. But anyway, just thing to say that the, the, the search engine is not going to see your page the way that people see it. The search engine is going to see your page in code. And so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we're doing some things that the search engines love so that the code is good and that they get to see um, things that they need to see in order to rank our pages. So, um, and we're going to talk about, this is, this is pretty much the bread and butter of on-site um, on -site SEO and when we do article creation. This, and we all know, because when you think about when you go to a search engine and type in your term, and then, you know, the headline, as it were, or the title is in blue. And that's where we're going to make sure that we are creating titles and descriptions that show up in the search engine rankings that cause people to want to click on those. And so, you know, best practices for those is obviously use keyword rich phrases that best describe the web page. You want people to know what they're coming for. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're no longer selling purple widgets, but you're landing purple widget traffic on a page that's selling something different, um, that's not only is it not going to get you any business, it's not going to be good for your rankings and people are going to, are going to um, not trust you. Um, make them unique for each page and use a strong CTA, which is call to action based on buyer intent. Now I'll tell you guys this too, and, and we'll talk about this as we go through just as a, as a, an on page optimization thing. I see web pages all the time that don't have any sort of call to action. The, the person who put the page up just assumes that the person is going to know what to do when they get there. And, and, and we don't, we're dumb. We can't figure that out. We have to be told what to do as though we were simple. And, and so many people don't do that. So if your goal for bringing someone to a page is to get them to sign up for your newsletter, you need to, you need to impress upon them somewhere between five and nine times that signing up for your newsletter is a great thing. This, this title is the place where you start with that, right? So if your goal is to get them to call for an appointment or to download the, the lead hook guide that you're promoting or whatever, you need to make sure that you're communicating that in a way that is clear and concise. Um, and then you want to try to keep your, your, your headline between 55 and 65 characters. That's just because you're limited to that amount of space. We all use Twitter. We know how that works. Um, we're going to talk about how to create um, how to create our blog posts so that they are the most search engine friendly. And that is going to involve um, making sure that we have things like H1 tags appear only once in a page. That's the H1 tag is the biggest and the boldest. And that's where we put our main primary keyword. And that says, hey, Google, this is what my page is about. And then you can use H2 and H3 tags further down in the text to help Google understand that these are the secondary topics and the tertiary topics. And um, you just want to make sure that all of that is clear. And we'll, and I'll walk you guys through. You'll, you will, we will talk about um, on-page stuff quite frequently. Um, we will, we will be making sure everyone is doing that correctly. And then this section right here is the, is the description or the meta description area. And that is where people can get a quick, um, a quick look at what your page is about. So, so going back to when I was taking journalism, 
my journalism t uh, professor said that a person should be able to skim through the headlines while they glance at the paper and get an idea of what's going on in the world. And then they should be able to read the first paragraph of each story and know what's going on. And then the further, obviously, you go down into the story, the more detailed. So if we take that logic and we apply it to search engine listings, a person should be able to scan down that page and look at the headlines, the titles, and be able to tell what options are available. And then a person should be able to read the first paragraph or the meta description and get a clear idea of what each one of those options is about. So we need to make sure that in that meta description, in that little bit of 120 to 150 characters, hey, Twitter used to be limited to 144 characters, so we should be able to do that pretty easily, right? So we want to make sure that we're getting our good a good call to action in there as well, okay? We want to make sure that we're getting our keywords in that text earlier because Google's bot says, hey, you know, things at the beginning are more important than things at the end, okay? Just sort of the way that they value that real estate. Make them unique for each page. Don't say, you know, greatest boudoir photographer in, you know, wherever, Poughkeepsie, New York, in every single page on your website because that's not Google. They're just going to ignore it, right? Because it, obviously you didn't put any effort into making this accurate. So why would they consider it relevant? That's just the way that works. And again, try to keep those at around 120 to 150 characters long just because it's going to get cut off. If it's, a, you know, if you put a gigantic description, it's going to get truncated and you're just going to lose some of that, right? Um, content creating, and we are going to talk a lot, lot, lot about content creating. You guys are going to become content creation ninjas by the time we're done with this because this is the engine that is going to drive everything that we're going to do. Prioritize profitable topics. Identify one to three keywords or key phrases that relate to your topic. And this is going to be basically where our homework starts coming in. Let me check just to make sure nobody is trying to get into the meat. No, we're good. Okay, so this is where your um, my, my, my Google Meet call ends in seven minutes. So I'm going to run through this and I'll, give, I'll email everybody a copy of this PDF. I want you guys to go through and come up with 12, because that's what we're going to start with, keywords and key phrases that you want to promote for your business in 2023, and that's where we're going to start. We're going to use one to three of those in each article that we write, okay? Um, tune content to your audience, balance informative content for the human reader with keyword placement. And I'm going to add to that, in addition to keyword placement, we're also going to work on balancing graphic elements in that with the assumption that our people are not going to read all of that text. Um, but that's probably stuff we're going to talk about in next week or two weeks down the road. Keep readers clicking. Ensure that you have interlinking from your content to other related topics on your website. If you're talking about bridal boudoir in your blog post, then you need to link to a bridal boudoir gallery in that blog post. You need to have graphic elements that support bridal boudoir or whatever your keyword happens to be. You want to have, you know, you want to have graphic elements on that page that tell both the search engine spider as well as visitors what this page is about. Um, and keep published content optimized and track performance and optimize accordingly. Like I said, if we're not measuring it, um, then if we're not going to do anything about the measurements, right, if we're not going to make changes based on our data flow, then why measure? So we're going to really want to take a look at, you know, what keywords are working, um, what offers are working for people, what links are people clicking on, and what they're not clicking on. So as we move into five minutes, I just want to run, run down really quickly with you guys what I want you to do. If you don't have a completely fleshed out Google business page, that is your number one thing that I want you to do. We get thousands and thousands of views a month just simply on the images that are connected to our Google business thing. Um, it's, it is imperative that you do that. If you don't do that, do that like today for real. And then the second thing for your homework for next week is identify 12 to, I say 12 to 20. Um, don't go overboard with it. Certainly don't, you know, because you can get so many key phrases that you just, it just becomes frustrating. 
So I would like for us to work with somewhere around 12 or maybe as many as 20 if you're in a, an area where doing some long tail <clears throat> and micro niche advertising would be beneficial to you, um, then expand that to 20. But let's, let's look at about 12 keywords that you believe would be um, things that people will be searching for in your area. And honestly, the way you do that is you, I mean, you can use something like Google Trends or whatever, or you can just go on and type boudoir photography, um, you know, San Antonio, and it will show you what your competitors are ranking for. And you can look at their topics and you can look at their titles and you can look at their descriptions, their meta descriptions, and kind of get an idea of what keywords those pages are ranking for. I think most people probably know what their, um, what their keywords are going to be. You know, obviously, boudoir photographer near me should be at the top of everyone's list because that's something that that a, an appreciable number of people are looking for. Boudoir pricing, um, you know, that's some things that people are going to be looking for. Think of questions that people might be asking and you can develop some long tail keywords. You know, do I do my own makeup for boudoir photography? If you're providing um, HMUA services, then that's a great way for you to value add your service. If you're not, it's a good way for you to create a small PDF lead hook, and we'll talk about that later, but and, and something of value that you give to a potential client at the lead stage in exchange for their contact information, right? So if you're not doing HMUA services as part of your package, then you can create a, um, uh, a how-to self, selfie, as it were, uh, beauty guide, you know, five five tips that your that your makeup artist doesn't want you to know about doing your own makeup for boudoir photography. I know that sounds kind of weird, but pe that's a lead hook, and people would be interested in that. So we're down to two minutes, guys. We are going to do this every week. Email me questions because it's hard for me to keep track of the of the chat while I'm talking. Um, I will email everybody a copy of this um, PowerPoint thing. In PDF form so you guys can can see this for those of you who didn't get to see it or couldn't see it on the screen or whatever um, so that's it I'm Jason this is how I'm gonna do this I'm gonna go through here and give you guys pertinent information the rest of the stuff will probably not be as much PowerPointy and will be more hands-on um, but let me know what you think about it um, I'm committed to doing this every week for you guys um, you know like I said before um, if you are um, if you are so inclined and you would, and you would, let me get over here and get the sun. If you were so inclined and you would like to buy me a coffee, <laughs> I'm totally okay with that. If not, I'm totally okay with that too, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Um, I guess maybe the Google Meet thing. Oh, no, I, I, I logged in early. So we're good. Thank you so much. We're going to. Well, I'm going to punch out now. I'll see you guys next week. Let me know if you have any questions.